Well, good morning. Again, so glad to be here. Uh, so great to see and to worship together. And um, can't wait for the Lord's Supper. And uh, looking, always look forward to that. Look forward to that here at Van Sickle. Just a time to be together in community and to recall why uh, we do what we do. Uh, we are in Galatians. I'm going to invite you to go to your, your Bible, turn to chapter 4. Uh, we'll be moving right along in our uh, Grace Marathon, and today we're looking at a, at a passage that's a little bit tricky and a little bit uh, just kind of out of the ordinary for Paul and maybe out of the ordinary for you and me because uh, we don't usually talk about Scripture this way as an allegory. We're going to get there here in just a second. But if you remember last week, we talked about how important uh, friends are to our spiritual growth. Uh, they are vital. We need to be asked hard questions. We need to be encouraging. We need somebody who's, who's growing alongside us, who's, who's uh, walking with us. And that was so important. And Paul kept saying to the Galatians how much and how deeply he cares for them, how much he loves them. And it hurts him to see them walking a different direction. And so he's asking some hard questions. What happened? Why do you do this? He's going to continue asking some of those questions uh, today. But just a reminder for us, do we have friends like that who can ask you spiritually hard questions, right? Not how's the weather, how are the cowboys, oh sorry, <laughs> mavericks, rangers, I don't have my Houston Astros socks on today, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, but, but a deep question for you. How are you doing with Jesus? How, what are you reading in your Bible today, this week? What are you praying for? Those should be questions that we should be asking and, and being asked. Just important stuff. Friends care about friends, and they care about your spiritual growth and what that means for us. And then Last week we talked about Paul being sick or ill or what his sickness was, his ailment. What was it going on physically? And he turned that into a, an opportunity for the gospel. Usually that's an opportunity for me to complain. Right? Something's going wrong and I'm like, Ugh, why God? Why is this happening now of all times? Right? I don't like this. This hurts. I want it done with now. And Paul turns his physical ailment, whatever it was, into an opportunity for the gospel. Ooh. That's where we need to be, is looking around for opportunities, good or bad. Bad things are good things. We just sang about it. It becomes an opportunity for the gospel. Hey, I'm sick, and it's caused me to run into you today. And so let's talk about what's different, what's important, what's eternal I have a flat tire. I have a washer and dryer that went out. The repairman comes. All right, let's talk about the gospel. I have an appointment with a whatever. Let's talk about the gospel. And it happens every once in a while just by design, but also you and I have to be ready for it, right? And you have to understand that this could be one of those not intended to be a leading question, but the Holy Spirit made it a leading question. And so the door just seems to open up as an opportunity for the gospel. So important for us to turn situations like that into gospel opportunities. And then, it, Paul said all along, be discerning. He wants the Galatians to be discerning, to, to really think about what's going on. It is heart, uh, it is grace, and it is faith, but you also need to be thinking about the philosophies that are going around the world around you. And so we've got to be discerning. That's what that means, to, to see kind of the message behind the message, if you will. The question behind the question, what's really, what's really going on here, right? In our movies, where we hear stories, in our TV shows, where we watch stuff, in the news, what's going on behind some of these things? When we read stuff, what's really the point? What's really true? What's really accurate? And in today's day and age, when there are so many voices and so many messages, we better be praying and discerning. And not just accepting. And that's kind of what's happened to the church. These Galatian churches have trusted Jesus, have heard Paul's gospel and the, the message of Christ. And then these false teachers, this false group has slipped in and said, Oh, hey, that's all great, but there's more you have to do. And it sounds pretty good. Oh, okay, let me just add that 
to the gospel. And Paul says, no, don't, stop. And so as we read on today, we're going to see a little bit more. He's building on this argument again. And he's presenting another case and another point. And he's bringing up, he's really kind of dropping a bomb right here on, the, on this false teacher's on what they think they are, who they think they are, and who Paul thinks they are, and who God thinks they are. And then we better be careful. We better be discerning along the way as we, as we think through this. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. It is true, and it is trustworthy. And it reveals Jesus in every book. And so it requires us uh, to, to make a personal, a personal response. So let's pray. Let's ask God to speak, and let's listen with our hearts. God, thank you for today. And thank you for you. Thank you for the way that you speak. And I thank you for being so personal and heart to heart with us and gracious and loving. And I pray we would hear with our hearts today how, how much you love us, how much you are for us, how much you have promised us. And God, I pray it would sink in, and it would sink into our hearts, and it would, it would grow roots and bear fruit and guard our minds, guard our thoughts, guard our thinking about all the messages around us, that we would see and understand and know the truth above all from your word. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. We're in Galatians 4, we're in chap, uh, chapter 4, yep, 21, verse 21. And we're going to read about these next 10 verses. We're going to kind of look at verse 1 of chapter 5 because it kind of relates. But we'll save most of that for next week. Next week, it just starts to pick up. You think we've been going slow. It's, next week, it is all about the Spirit. Can you wait? Uh, all about the Spirit. But till then, we're still talking Old Testament and slavery. All right? Feels like slavery sometimes. Look at verse 21. Tell me, Paul's asking, here's the question. Tell me this. You who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born according or born through the promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the child of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just, at, just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Lots there. What's Paul talking about? Why does he use this allegory? Why does he connect these Old Testament characters, Hagar and Sarah? He never mentions Sarah, never mentions Ishmael or Isaac, but he's highlighting some things that are real important for us to remember that the promise only goes one way. It only goes through one line, and it's through the promise, and it's through the miraculous work of God. And so as we see that, it'll, it'll become even more clear, I hope, along the way. Look at verse 21. He says, tell me, you des who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? He's, he's asking, do you understand the thought process is going on here? We do, this, we do this a ton today. We think, oh, if I just have this, then life will be all right. Life will be better. We do this with food every once in a while. Man, if I could just, uh, just, just one more bite. We were in Germany on this mission trip that I'm, I'm going back in June, and we were at, a, at a, someone's farmhouse, so we were the guests. We have to be respectful of the hosts, right? And they kept bringing out these skewers of meat. 
and just over and over. We're eating, and it was good. And, and I'm with all these little high school and college athletes, and there's one other pastor with me, and these kids are putting away the food. I mean, they're being good guests, right? And I'm thinking, well, i got to keep up. So I don't, we were somewhere in double digits of putting away skewers of this meat, and he said, oh, I've got more. And I thought, no, 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 we're done. He had, he had showed us all the, and we just, here came another round, and here came another round, and here came another round, and here came another round. I don't know how many kilograms we had eaten, but I couldn't eat one more. And then he brings another round, right? And I'm not going to be, you know, I've got to be a good guest, right? I've got to be respectful <laughs> to my host. And we, I don't know how much, I really don't. But that's kind of how it is, right? We think just one more is okay. Just one more is going to be, we do it with money too. If I just had X in the bank account. How many stories have we seen of those who win the lottery? Does it make their life better? It's more miserable usually. But we think this still for us. If I just had this, if I just had a better job, then I'd be able to do this. And then all of a sudden it brings all these extra responsibilities, all these extra things that tie us down. And it takes away. There's biblical examples of this as well. Do you remember when the children of Israel were in the, in the desert, they were walking around and they said, hey, we are tired of manna. God says, all right, I'm going to send you quail. Moses, tell them to be ready for the quail. And in Numbers, it says they ate. I'm not sure we should talk about this on Sunday mornings, right? And then they started throwing up the quail. It came out of their nose is what it says. Just if we had this, another miracle, then we'd follow God. If we just could get this, then our life would be better and it never satisfies. Jesus said the same thing when the, when the Pharisees came to him and said, give us a sign. He said, you'll never be satisfied with a sign. When the prodigal son said, give me my inheritance, did that work out for him? And that's what Paul is reminding us right here. It's not about the stuff. It's not about adding to. It's about being content and free in your salvation. The righteousness of Christ, his death on the cross and resurrection changed eternity. But somehow, for some reason, the Galatians want to add to that based on what they're hearing. Paul's saying, be discerning. Do you listen to what the law says? You've got to add this. You've got to do this. You've got to, you've got to perform up to this level to be accepted, to be righteous, to be made whole, to be complete. Problem is, we don't ever know. This is, a moving, this is a moving line. But under Jesus, and because of Jesus, who redeemed us from the curse, we can know once and for all what salvation is, and it can be ours. And Paul's saying, do you understand it? Let me, help me understand your thought process. He says, you're, you're under something. And just as we think, oh, I just, if I could just get this, if I could just get that, it seems to pile on an extra weight on us. And now we're less free. We're tied down. We're weighted down. And we're stuck under the law, these laws, the laws of diminishing return is what some, someone's called it. It's never enough. Our earthly stuff is never enough to meet our spiritual need. So he says, are you listening? Let's continue to be discerning. As he moves on to verse 22, he, he writes, it is written. Now he said, do you listen? Now he says, it is written. Abraham two, had two sons, one by a slave, one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born according to the promise. So Paul takes him way back again to Abraham. Remember, he's talked about there was a promise. The promise came before Moses, and y'all trying to find, you're trying to follow Moses' law. But it goes back to Abraham with a promise. Way before we ever had to do all the laws. And now he goes back and he's, he's bringing us back to Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham and Hagar. And he wants to show us something in here. He says it's, it's, a, it's about the flesh. And when Abraham and Sarah heard that God was 
promise was, hey, you're going to be a, a great nation. You're going to bless all nations. They said, all right, we need to help God out because we're, we're old. And so their way of helping out was fleshly. Does that make sense? It, it was physical. It was earthly. They said, Sarah said, why don't you take Hagar, my, my servant, and have a son with her? They were trying to work it out. That's why it's of the flesh and not of the promise. God said, no, 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 no. Abraham, I'm going to do it through you. I'm going to do it through Sarah. And that's going to be ultimately, literally, a miracle. She was 90. That's going to be the promise. Not something you or I try to work out. I'm trying to get God's favor, so I'm here today. I'm trying to get God's favor, so I'm going to pray. I'm going to attempt to get God's favor by giving. Hey, you already have God's favor in Jesus. And that's what Paul wants the Galatians to get. They're trying to add, they're trying to work, they're trying to perform. And Paul's saying, are you listening to what's going on here? It is written way back, right, in the Old Testament, same promise. Genesis 16, 17 is where they're working all this stuff out. And it's interesting because the, the name Ishmael, if you, if you remember your Hebrew, all those Hebrew lessons you had, when there's a, a word that ends in E-L, that is short for God. And so even with Abraham and, and Sarah doing this, pulling in Hagar, and they name him Ishmael, it means God hears. Interesting, when we're trying to work stuff out, we try to put a nice little bow on it and make it sound good. We want it to look right. Hey, God, look at this. We're even going to name him, you hear, did you hear us? That's convicting. If we try to work stuff out, say, hey, God, look here. Do I need to shout louder? Do I need to do this more? What is it going to take? God's saying, you already have my attention. I love you, period. From the very beginning. God says, I am a God of, of compassionate love, steadfast love, slow to anger, rejoicing in righteousness on your behalf. I want to be your God. I want to walk with you, and I want you to walk with me. From the very beginning, that's all he said. And so as he's unpacking this for us, he's reminding us in and through, hey, it was written. Here's what happened. Here's what they tried to do. He says, stop trying. And he says the woman, the, the son of the free woman was born through uh, this promise, the promise from the very beginning that God would be his God. God would be Abraham's God. God would do these things. God would work this out. You and I don't have to try. We don't have to add anything to that. We can't. It just makes us tired. We end up being under an incredible weight. And then he brings this in in verse 20, 24. He said, now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. Let's stop right there. What is, what is allegory? Do you remember this from freshman English? Yeah, me either. I had to go look it up, right? What is an allegory? Well, it's, it's giving an extra layer. It's writing. It's a literary device that a lot of authors will use to give an extra layer, maybe kind of to camouflage what they're doing, but it's always a deeper layer, maybe even an abstract layer to the story. Think Wizard of Oz. Does that help? Follow the yellow brick road. We've got red slippers. We have a lion. We have a scarecrow. We have a tin man. Do those have deeper meanings? Do you remember that in freshman English? You remember the movie? The Wizard of Oz, Oz stands for ounce, and so he's writing about gold, the yellow brick road, gold in the bond. How about the Lord of the Flies, one of your favorite books? How about the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, little C.S. Lewis? Again, the lion stands for somebody else, stands for Jesus, the witch, evil. So those are the kind of things that's bringing on this extra layer here. Now, Early on, especially in the early church history, they did this a ton with Old Testament stuff. 
And they would pick characters and, and sites, geographical sites, and give them new meaning in the New Testament. And so what Paul does is, is kind of the same thing because he brings Hagar to Mount Sinai. Now those two things could, it'd be hard to be any further apart. Hagar precedes Mount Sinai by 500 years. Mount Sinai is where the Jews came to get the law and express their freedom from Egypt. So what do Hagar and Mount Sinai have to do with each other? Not much, except that they were both slaves. Mount Sinai ended up being where we got the law, the Ten Commandments, all the different interpretations of that all along, and that's what began to enslave people because they thought, oh, if I can keep the law, then I can be right with God. Same as with Hagar. Abraham and Sarah chose Hagar to try to work things out, to make things right, to fulfill this promise that God said, I will do, not you. And so those two things begin to to add up here. If you remember what the Judaizers are doing, what these false teachers are doing is they're saying, we are children of the covenant, children of the law. You have to keep all of these ceremony rituals. You got to keep all these sacrifices. You have to keep circumcision, which was, happened at Sinai. But they want to say they are descendants of Abraham. So Paul's almost doing this. He's dropping a bomb right here on these false teachers And he's pointing his finger and he's saying, you are sons of Hagar, not Isaac, not Abraham, not Jacob. You're sons of the slave woman because you believe slavery is better than being free. And all of a sudden, for the early church, this would be like either a brush of fresh air or oh my. These things are opposites. They couldn't be any more opposites. And he goes on to say, the one from Mount Sinai, she's bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar, he says in verse 25, is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, the earthly center of religion in Paul's day. It is that religion that Paul's pointing his finger at and saying that religion will never, ever gain salvation. It can't make salvation. You can't manufacture it. You can't be good enough. You can't try hard enough. And he's looking at that present-day Jerusalem as a center of slavery because of what it teaches religiously. That's how dangerous. He wants the Galatians to understand. He wants them to think. He wants them to be discerning. There are good things about Jerusalem, right? But in this time, in this place, he's equating Jerusalem with the religion that says you have to be circumcised. You have to follow these rules. You have to do, do, do all of these things to earn your salvation. Listen, religious legalism will always produce self-inflicted slavery. You will never know if you've done enough. You will always be under a burden. You will always wonder. And Paul's goal, he says here, is for for us to be a part of the new Jerusalem. Read on, verse 26, he says, But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. He doesn't mention Sarah. But he mentions this new Jerusalem. Isaiah is full of this language. Uh, Genesis gives us a little bit of this. Hebrews 12 talks about a new Jerusalem. Isaiah 66 says Zion is in labor. Zion was God's choice city. It was Jerusalem. And so when we get this picture, we get this picture of salvation that comes through the promise that God's given to be a citizen of a of this new Jerusalem, this holy Jerusalem. That's a new and eternal life for us. And that's why he says it is, a, it is from above and it is free. Now, Paul talks about this. The New Testament talks about this, this, this concept of salvation being already and not yet. When someone trusts Christ, they are already saved, but their completion, our completion is when? 
It's when we experience eternal life with God in heaven. So it's already, the results are now, but it's also future. And so as, as Paul talks about this idea of this new Jerusalem, it's above, it's free, it is now, now you can be confident and certain, but there's also a completion time and a completion date that's coming. So he's writing, uh, telling the Galatians, hey, you know what? There is more to life. There's more to life than just this present life. There's more to life than just your watch and your calendar and your schedule. There's this new Jerusalem. There's eternity coming. And that's what we're living for. Not not what can we do for God today to earn his righteousness, but what can we do today for God because he is great, because he is loving, because he's our God, because he has saved us. That's what he starts to talk about. That's where this, the whole letter starts to pivot right here. And he quotes again, verse 27. Look here. He's describing this incredible difference. And he's, he's, this is Isaiah 54. He says, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth. Cry aloud, you who are not in labor. So clearly it's a reference to Sarah being barren. But it's also a, a reference to what God's going to do in and through this promise. Isaiah 54 is written during the exile. They're bringing back the exiles thinking we're never getting back to Jerusalem. But God had promised after 70 years, after 70 years of exile, this is going to happen. And so Paul sees this same fulfillment coming even now in New Testament. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. A lot of times we use our eyes to look at external things and think, oh, this is how it's going to work out. This is how it's going to play out. This is what it's going to be like. And Isaiah and Paul and Peter and John and Jesus say, don't just look with your eyes. The things that look barren, the things that look desolate, God's doing something behind those scenes. God has a promise and a plan and a purpose. And it is for you and it's for me. Look at how he changes how he changes his tone right here, verse 28. Now you brothers, brothers like Isaac. All of a sudden he's connecting the Galatians and those churches back to Isaac, the, the son of the promise. You Isaac, brothers like Isaac, you are children of the promise. Verse 29, but just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him, who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. In his statement of inclusion, he says to this, hey, look out, there's going to be persecution. There's going to be mocking. Back in Genesis 21, that's what Ishmael does. Ishmael, Hagar's son, laughs at Isaac, whose name means laughter, one who, who laughs. And there's this play on words that, that Ishmael is mocking Isaac, persecuting Isaac. And because of that, Sarah gets mad and says, cast him out. He's not going to share any inheritance. Here's here's what's interesting is is the false teacher said, hey, look at Paul. Paul is suffering. Remember why he's in Galatia? He's in Galatia the first time because of injuries, persecution, because he's been stoned, he's been whipped, he's been cast out. They say if he was if he was really God's messenger, you know what? He wouldn't suffer. He wouldn't be in trouble all the time. He wouldn't be arrested for preaching the gospel. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Back up. Even from the beginning, Genesis, there's always been persecution for those who trust Jesus, for those who trust God and his provision. There's always been suffering. I guess we can't do the name it and claim it. We can't have that health and wealth gospel. We can't just preach prosperity. We need to preach the whole gospel. And that's what Paul's reminding them right here is persecution's apart. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, hey, people are going to slander you, the church, you, the Christian. Early on in the early church, they called them cannibals because of the Lord's Supper. Slander. They called them haters and exclusive. 
uh, religious fanatics. That persecution, Paul says, is normal. It's actually the sign on the other end that you're doing what is right, what is genuine, what is true, when you're being called out for the name of Jesus. And that's what's going on here. It's what he's writing about. He says uh, that Sarah, he quotes Sarah, verse, uh, verse 30, he says, What does Scripture say? So we've had, it is written, it is written. Here's what Scripture says. Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave, slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. He's, he's called these false teachers uh, the sons of the slave woman. And he said they're not getting what the sons of the promise get. You and I, who have trusted Jesus to be Lord and Savior of our life, are sons of the promise. We get the inheritance because of what Jesus has done on yours and my behalf. And when he says cast out, there's this, there's this sharp break Paul wants to make. This really clear, obvious break between what is true, what is right, what is faithful, what is promised, what is grace, what is redemption, that he said over and over and over in this letter. And asking the Galatians to be discerning, to be thinking, to, to know and understand that what's most satisfying is a relationship with Jesus, not with the law. Those two things are so far apart. It's like a slave of, of a slave woman versus the son of a free woman. And lastly, he says this, verse 31, so brothers, here we are inclusive again, right? So brothers, we, we are not children of the slave, but of the free. We need to remember, it's, it's one of those, those phrases, maybe your translation says so, maybe it says therefore right there. Paul's, Paul always reminds us with one of these great therefores, you want to see what it's there for, what is it referring to, why is it He's giving us this declaration. We are not children of the slave. We are children of the free. He wants to drive this, drive this part of his argument home. Once and for all, free, free, free. That's who you are in Christ. You can't earn it. You can't work hard enough. There's not enough to do in, in your short lifetime. But if you trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus then you are free. If you look ahead just a little bit, a little foreshadowing in, into chapter 5, verse 1, he says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. What other reason could there be? It is for freedom. Freedom from all restraints? No. Freedom from religious law. Freedom from having to earn or try. Paul's writing, he's fixed us. He's fixing to spring into what does life look like according to the Spirit in chapter 5. He's saying the law is so limiting, it's slavery, you're under a weight. But you, because of Jesus, have been guaranteed freedom if you'll simply have faith. That's it. That's it. If you will simply have faith and then move from there. Deuteronomy reminds us, Jesus said it's the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's it. God sent Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. That way we can be free. Here's a couple applications for us today. It's not always easy to identify our legalistic tendencies. We think, oh, if I'm just positive, right? If I just think positive all the time, then things around me would be positive, right? If I just eliminate some of the, the bad stuff in my life, then my life will be good. If I just do this, I get in a routine. You ever watch baseball players? jump over the first baseline because they're a little superstitious? That's us. If I will keep doing this stuff just like this, and then something goes wrong and we think, oh, I must have stepped on a crack. Right? Oh, ah, I must not have been believing hard enough. 
This is how we are. We have to identify these kind of tendencies in our thinking. Paul's saying, be discerning. What do you think? Trying to live under the law. Tell me what your process is. Back up. Identify those tendencies. And then move forward into the Spirit. Pursue the Spirit, he says, with, and the promise. Pursue that. What's most important is to be reminded of the promise, not positivity necessarily. Remind yourself of God, God's promise to you and to me is that if you trust Christ, if you trust Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if you trust Jesus to forgive you of your sin, he does it. Once and for all, past, present, future sins were canceled on the cross. And as a result, now we pursue life in the Spirit. That's coming up. That's part now. Then lastly, the choice is yours. And so he's given the churches in Galatia this choice. Here's, here it is. It's this. You can choose to live under the law, or you can choose to live with a promise. I don't know how many of you are fans of The Matrix, right? The movie, when he offers the blue and the red pill. It's a meme a lot of, on our social media. Which one are you going to choose? One... You get to stay the same. The other opens up a new world to you. Hey, we are faced with that kind of a choice every day. To live a life of faith or to live a life of trying and trying harder. That's our choice. He says it to the Galatians. What are you going to choose? Are you going to be that son of the free woman and live under the promise? Or are you going to live under slavery and legalism? Let's pray together. God, thank you for, for our time today. Thank you for your word as it speaks. And I pray that it go down and sink down into our hearts and our hearts would be good soil. And that the roots would, would grow deep and, and bear fruit, would grow and mature and be multiplied. God, thank you for this, this letter in, in the Bible that just reminds us of the emptiness of religion and the hope and the grace of salvation. God, I pray that you would use it in our lives often. And God, I pray you'd just give us uh, the mind of Christ as we think through and as we discern and as we seek what's most important for our lives. Help us to know there's more. There's more than just this. And we say thank you for Jesus most of all. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.